Look at that. <laughs> I see Dr. Rosensweet. Good morning. Good morning, Carolyn. It is nice to see you as always. And welcome everybody who's going to be coming up or watching the playbacks. And happy Thanksgiving weekend or week <laughs> going into the weekend. So we have our questions. And we're going to get started, and we're going to get great answers, as we always do. <laughs> huh. <laughs> Number one, Dr. Rosen Sweet. Good morning, you guys. Um, interesting question. Don't our adrenals produce all four of the hormones? Um, that would be... Uh, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and DHEA? And if so, would this then not help to keep our receptors open? I really appreciate your thoughts on this. No. Next question. <laughs> right. Okay, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> um, the adrenals are glands, and they do produce things that some things that can relate to gonadal hormones. But the principal gonadal hormones <clears throat> relevant in menopause and andropause are coming out of the gonads. That would be for women, the ovaries and the, and the testicles for men. And the ovaries produce four hormones, the estrogen family, there's three active estrogens, progesterone, testosterone, and DHEA. That's the principal source of the these main uh, gonadal steroid hormones coming out of the ovary. Now, the adrenals produce powerful hormones. In fact, there's even a, a, a relevance there. The adrenal glands produce some progesterone, but not much, and it's and in the adrenals, it's mainly used to produce what progesterone can be converted to, which is cortisol. So in the biochemical roadmaps, in which one thing is converted to another, converted to another, converted to another, the uh, progesterone is produced in the adrenal, but not enough to do what women need progesterone for their whole lives. Yeah, it's just a small amount. Yeah, so, amount. Yeah. so when we test women who aren't having periods anymore, yes, they have a little bit of progesterone, but not much at all. And we want to have a robust amount of progesterone. So the adrenals are not going to cover the progesterone need. Yes, the adrenals can put, produce some androgens, DHEA, testosterone. Absolutely, they can. But you'll never get the amount of testosterone out of the DHEA and testosterone that's coming out of the adrenals. <laughs> Your requirements for lifetime health of muscles, for the muscle that holds up the bladder so that you don't get into adult diapers, for your bones, for your mood, the adrenal testosterone and DHEA is not going to do it for you. You need supplemental <clears throat> testosterone and DHEA. Got it. And uh, we know this from 24-hour urine hormone testing. These levels are very low, but we also know it for women who do not replenish their testosterone and DHEA. The testosterone gives the clearest uh, issues. They lose muscle and get into uh, something named sarcopenia, which means muscle loss. And you can see it and feel it. The muscles That's get too amazing. thin. And eventually it leads to canes because you, uh, you don't have enough muscle strength to stand and walk properly. And canes can yield to walkers, not enough muscle strength. And walkers can cross over to the need for wheelchairs. And that's a uh, intense moment because <clears throat> many families cannot support the woman at home at that point. And it's the need to move into an assisted living facility or a nursing home just because of inadequate testosterone and the adrenals are not going to do it for you. And 
Also for the muscle, again, that holds up the, the bladder and you can get into incontinence in adult diapers. So we love the adrenal glands. They're critical. You must have adrenal glands to live. What The part that you need for live is the corticosteroids, the cortisol. Without that, you don't get to live. Mm-mm. The adrenal gland produces a, a, a extremely crucial corticosteroids and also adrenaline come out of a different part of the adrenal. So the adrenal glands, we love them, we need them. <laughs> they uh, can decline in their ability to output these hormones, uh, corticosteroids, and the, even the androgens, and the and the adrenalines. But uh, as far as gonadal hormones, estrogen, testosterone, DHEA, and progesterone, the adrenals will n- not produce anywhere near the amount that's really needed and yes testosterone in a woman and in a man can be converted to some estradiol so some adrenal testosterone can put in a little bit of estradiol in the system but nowhere near the amount that a woman needs for health and vitality and protection of her vagina and her bones so the adrenal glands is blessed and as crucial and critical for life as they are will not be a sufficient or near sufficient source of the gonadal hormones for women or for men for that matter it's interesting because it all works in such perfect harmony and yet for all those years that we did make all those hormones as you're saying they did not come out of the adrenal glands meaning all four that's right Thank you. Thank you for that. Well, we love our adrenals. <laughs> so I guess we're going to keep them, <laughs> whatever they put out, as you just well explained. Thank you so much for that. Um, you made mention of the second question, and that is, um, Dr. Rosensweet, what is the 24-hour urine test, and why is it considered the golden standard of testing? Um, there's different ways that are used to test hormone levels in women and men. And the most popular of methods to test a lot of things plus hormones is draw blood and check out the blood levels. And this works well in young women and young men to test their hormone levels, their basic hormone levels. In young women, in order to really get an idea of what hormone levels are coming out of the ovaries, you need to test the young women at a certain time of the month. Optimal is the third week of a menstrual, of a four week menstrual cycle. That's when there's rich levels of estrogen and progesterone. That's when you wanna test a woman Now, this is in a regularly menstruating women. Regularly menstruating women are not the women who are showing up necessarily for hormone evaluation. (laughs) By the time a woman is having difficulty, she's often having a regular period. So it's a little harder to test her, but she still can be tested. And young men and men can be tested uh, through serum levels for testosterone and some other things. Sex hormone binding globulin is very relevant. So we want that. Thyroid hormones can be tested quite well, providing you do the right thyroid panel. Um, However, once you start treating a woman or a man with hormones, blood has some challenges. For example, when did the woman apply her preceding hormonal dosages? So the standard ritual is, let's say a woman applied her progesterone and her uh, estrogen at night. Then if you test the next morning, you're going to get somewhat of an idea of how she's doing, but not a lot because the hormones that she applied at night, by that time, they've left the blood pretty much. So they're not a great accurate Uh, measure. Now you can indirectly measure how much estrogen and progesterone a woman is getting by measuring a pituitary hormone 
called FSH and LH. <clears throat> when the brain and via the pituitary gland is registering that there's not enough estrogen and not enough progesterone, the pituitary gland starts putting out stimulating hormones to try and stimulate the ovaries. Even if they've ceased functioning for years, those stimulating hormones, FSH and LH, are very high. Same thing happens with thyroid. If the thyroid gland fails to put out enough thyroid hormone, the brain knows that. And via the pituitary gland, it puts out thyroid stimulating hormone to try and revive that thyroid. So if we get a high thyroid stimulating hormone level via the blood, we know that the thyroid gland is not putting out enough thyroid hormone and we replenish thyroid hormone. Likewise, we could use the FSH and LH, follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone coming out of the pituitary gland. Those levels are high. We know the ovary is no longer putting out sufficient estrogen and progesterone. So blood tests can function to a certain extent in that indirect way. And from, my, uh, from, from what I see and have known for 25 years, the state of the art in measuring a woman that's being treated, for example, with hormones is by collecting 24-hour urine. For one thing, ovarian hormones show up in the urine. We've known that for a thousand years. And we know that when we do do a 24-hour urine hormone collection and test by the, the most sophisticated test measures of all, we see estradiol, estriol, estrone, three active estrogens. We see the metabolites. What happens to estrogens when they go through the process of, of doing what they do? They get biologically transformed into something called metabolites to get excreted. We see testosterone levels. We see DHEA levels. We see what happens when testosterone and DHEA are utilized. They're transformed into metabolites to be excreted. We see progesterone and what it becomes via its principal metabolite. And we see the corticosteroids, cortisol, cortisone, and what they become. They all show up in the urine. We knew indirectly that the urine contained hormones. The Chinese aristocrats used to set up these outhouses for young women and young men and collect their urine separately of course the young women's urine was collected the young men's was collected and for the young both of them their individual urines were dried out and there was a powder left behind and the aristocratic women <laughs> were given the female urine powder and the aristocratic men were given the male urine powder and they were they youthful they, they became more youthful and they retained some sexual function they were happy the chinese knew that this was showing up in the urine the pharmaceutical manufacturers knew that this was showing up in the urine they experimented for a while by collecting pregnant women's urine but that never was a practical way because there wasn't enough of it they couldn't get enough of it Right. So what they did is they catheterized pregnant mares, that's horses, and collected their urine and dried that out and produced the most popular and profitable drug of the time, Premarin, pregnant mare urine, which had a ton of estrogens in there. And they worked and they did good work. They did a good job. 50% of them were unique to horses and had never been seen by a, a female, but they did good job. We know that hormones and their metabolites show up in the urine. And there is no perfect system for measuring, for example, when you when the ovary puts out a hormone or the testicles put out a hormone, how do they interact with the receptor sites? Are you getting the desired effect that you need? We're not measuring that by the 24-hour urine, but we're getting a very good reflection of what whether when you're replenishing ovarian hormones, four of them, the, the, the hormones and the metabolites show up in the urine and it's an 
excellent way to correlate. It's the best way, and it gets around the time of when the woman took her last dosages. By collecting for 24 hours, it doesn't matter when she took her last dosages. Well, now, as, long way, as, she, as long as she's taking them, right? Because a lot of women and, think stop hormones, then test. However, well, that's, that, that's a pilot error. <laughs> it does no good whatsoever to have a woman who's being treated with hormones stop her hormones and then collect her urine for 24 hours. That makes no medical sense whatsoever. And it's an error and it's done occasionally. But women who are taking hormones, our directions are, be sure you're taking your hormones precisely without missing a beat for at least a week before you collect your urine. And then for sure, be taking your hormones exactly like you always do when you're collecting your hormones. That's the way we get to see how much is in your body. And th this is extremely reliable because we're able to measure and assess from the medical literature and correlate with the medical literature. Well, what should those levels be to protect the bones in a woman? What should those levels be to protect the vagina? This work has been done, and I personally was able to correlate it with the 24-hour urine. So we know what, compromise, what comprises too little estrogen, for example. That's highly consequential. Bottom line, you want to be protecting those bones, and you want to be protecting that vagina, which protects the bladder somewhat. So... We've correlated that in, in, in the 24-hour urine hormone report. I report that optimal zone. We also report what constitutes too much. The medical literature says that at a certain point, you're going to get breast glandular cell proliferation yeah. if you have too much estrogen. We don't want cell division, new cells being produced, breast glandular cell proliferation in a woman who's in menopause. You know, that's a vulnerable moment in the cell's history when <laughs> you get cell division. These yeah. chromosomes are very vulnerable then. We don't want any mutations. Now, I'm not asserting that that's what the cause of cancer is. No way. But we're, we're extremely careful and meticulous about how we treat women in menopause. And so we don't want a woman to be on too much estrogen. Well, it's fascinating because we've done studies on what a 20 to 29 year old woman has, estrogen wise, progesterone, androgen wise, why select those women? Because they're the gold standard. Right. A woman's most robust output of her hormones is when she's 20, plus or minus a couple years, same for men. That's when these hormone levels are the highest. They all go into a decline after that. So it's not, to me, there's no value in comparing a woman to anything but a 20 to 29 year old. Doesn't mean we're trying to re, uh, replenish to the 20 to 29 year old levels. No, we're not in most cases, but we wanna have something to compare it to and we compare it to a 20 to 29 year old. So where else to go with this? I, I do have a question if I may. Yeah. Sure. Um, women, uh, will write often, um, can we go ahead and order our own 24 hour urine and how easy is it to read? <laughs> Good questions. Please. No, uh, these are laboratory tests that must be requested by a licensed healthcare provider, such as a physician, nurse practitioner, physician's assistant. And there are some exceptions for compounding pharmacies or doing advising. Yeah. That's how that's done. Same with ordering blood tests. Uh, well, this is getting a little blurry these days. Lay people do have a way to order uh, blood tests. But 24-hour urines to this date, um, the, the laboratories that do this um, ask for a physician or nurse practitioner to um, to write a requisition for it, official requisition, almost like a prescription. 
and how easy it is it to interpret. The great news about the 24-hour urine hormone test is it gives a tremendous amount of information. Over 20, 30 uh, analytes are there. Estradiol, estrone, estriol, the metabolites of estrogen, the metabolites of testosterone, testosterone, and DHA. It's a long list. And when I first saw my first 24-hour urine hormone test report 25 years ago, <laughs> it was extremely intimidating. I had gone to medical school. I did biochemistry. I, I understood the hormone biochemical pathways. And when I saw the number of analytes and some of the names there, it was daunting. No problem. I grokked that this was the way to test. And like anything in medicine or life, it takes doing 20, 30, 40, 100, 200 different repetitions before you start getting it. And I did. I, I went through that. I had the assistance of the 24-hour urine hormone labs. They all had an interpreter. And it took me 100 patients looking at 100 urines before I really got what was going on. That's a great thing because the level of precision, the information is so thorough that as a, as a professional, I, I, I learned so much from it. But, you know, it's harder. Well, it's just like me taking my, I can repair my automobile, or I used to be able to. But uh, the one time I rebuilt an engine, it was so much fun. It took me the whole winter to do it. I had every single engine part laid out in my garage and put it all back together and by god my corvair van ran after i rebuilt the engine it <laughs> ran for seven thousand miles at which point it froze <laughs> Oops. <laughs> and i learned because later i had a, a volkswagen engine rebuilt but and the mechanic who rebuilt it that's what he did he rebuilt volkswagen engines he let me observe him and i saw a thousand things that he did that i didn't even think of doing and I could see exactly why I would fail to have an engine that ran over 7,000 miles. So sorry to get so distracted there. There's one other thing that I said about the, I wanted to say about the upper limit of normal. Mm -hmm. for estrogen. We don't want to give too much estrogen. So a young woman, every single cycle, prepares for pregnancy. She also prepares for breastfeeding. So the estrogen that comes out initially after menstruation is over prepares uh, the cause proliferation of the lining of the uterus to prepare a rich fertile bed for a possible um, fertilized egg. It also starts preparing the woman's breast for breastfeeding every single cycle. She gets breast glandular cell proliferation. She can feel it. In many instances, women feel their breasts get fuller as the cycle progresses. There's extra cells being added there through cell division. And if she gets pregnant, there's even further preparation for lactation. Breasts get quite a bit larger. There's quite a bit of proliferation there. If she does not get pregnant, her breasts get less full as cells disappear that were developed every single cycle. Well, in menopausal women, we'd like to stay shy of breast glandular cell proliferation. So it turns out that if a young woman has this much estrogen to be healthy and menstruate, we, and when we're treating a menopausal woman, we want less because that much estrogen to be healthy and, and menstruate is going to cause breast glandular cell proliferation. So we want to come in just below that. And for most women, they're going to get all the benefit they need from not re replication of youthful levels. We don't need them to protect the bones in the vagina. It's because we don't want breast glandular cell proliferation. We don't want to increase breast density. That's a risk factor for um, breast health. Right. And you guys are all about breast health. Well, we are. Yes. And so now women vary enormously as to how much they need. Some women need this much estrogen to produce an, a, a normal menstrual cycle and be fertile and get pregnant. Other women need more. 
they need three times that much. That's how much women vary, woman to woman. Everyone within this range is producing healthy estrogen levels, for example, enough to get pregnant and have regular menstrual cycles. The proper treatment zone, we say, for most women is right below that. So there's no breast glandular cell proliferation that occurs every single cycle. There are exceptions. There are some women who really need more robust levels of estrogen. And we've I've addressed that at different times. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, the amount that really serves a menopausal woman is just less than what it takes for a 20 to 29 year old to, to regularly menstruate. I've gone adrift there. Hope it's not too complex. But um, the 24 hour year old test is state of the art. And they've tried to do what folks have called simpler versions of the 24-hour urine hormone test, like they've tried to collect urine for four times during a 24-hour urine, during for 24 hours, and to pee on the filter paper. There's labs doing that. But we've been doing comparative testing. There's, it, we just can't get that one right. There's a lot of reasons for that. So with all due respect, I challenge anyone who is doing the urine four point or five point. Now we're actually doing a study. It's underway now. We're comparing 24 hour urine hormone tests with two different labs, plus the urinary four point, plus saliva. Ah, yes, saliva. It's been around for a long time, but <clears throat> we're getting our, we're not getting correlations with uh, 24 hour urine hormone testing, uh, at all with saliva. So I'm sure I'll be challenged majorly when I say don't do saliva. But I mean that don't do it. The, we, the correlations and we've known this, I've known this for 25 years as I started out with saliva got some really strange results that didn't correlate with the patient's symptoms. And so sorry to say, but I am willing to take a stand and show data how it just doesn't compare with anything, including blood, 24 hour urine. So the proper way to test levels of hormones in women happens to be by collecting urine for 24 hours. We're currently running a cross test with men to see if we can assess men well enough with serum because traditionally that's been done and we're coming, we, this is a work in progress. Our, our IOBIM team is uh, splitting samples. We're having women and men have their blood drawn, collect their urine for 24 hours, do the urine four point on filter paper and see how they all compare. Do the saliva, see how they all compare. And we've got, that's a work in progress. But right now, the only one I personally can stand behind and recommend as the gold standard of testing is the 24-hour urine hormone test. Now, you opened up Pandora's box when you ask about testing because it's not the only thing that we want to use to assess a woman or a man. <clears throat> For example, bone loss is so almost guaranteed in women and men if we don't have adequate hormone levels. So we want to do a bone mineral density test to see if there's been bone loss. And um, if there has been bone loss, we want to see if the bone loss is actively occurring. So we'll do a blood or urine test called deoxypyridinolone or DPD to see if there's act too much bone metabolites sitting in that urine or blood. We want to do other assessments as well. Since breast glandular cell proliferation is not acceptable, we want to do periodic mammograms. And the, the rate of repetition depends on the woman herself. Mammograms are an extremely useful. They're not a perfect tool. None of these are perfect. And the breast imaging techniques have gotten far more sophisticated as well, including ultrasound and even thermography. Thermography is not good for assessing cancer risk, but it is very good. You get false, you get false negatives. 
I know this. So we never recommend thermography, uh, a very non-invasive and easy to do test. We never recommend it for assessing cancer risk, but we do recommend it for assessing inflammation. It measures heat. And when there's, infl- when there's heat, increased heat, there's usually inflammation. And inflammation is something we find you know, unacceptable in our breasts. And there's many things we can do to eliminate the, the breast inflammation. So there's other testing is what I'd like to say. There's sex hormone binding globulin blood test that's imperative uh, for women and men because it can cause a problem. For men, there's the, uh, dihydrotestosterone and estradiol. So the list goes on and on. There's many different ways we assess a midlife and later as folks get older, I can tell you, I can guarantee um, birthdays keep occurring. (laughs) As long as you're on earth, I'm living proof of it. (laughs) There's many different ways we assess. We don't assess excessively, but there's a lot of things we measure to get it right. The hormones are the most powerful biochemicals in our body. If we're going to use them, we want to be able to assess the levels and not get too much and not get too little. Right. And there's a rumor, and this is how I'll end this. There's been a rumor promulgated even by the North American Menopause Society and the American College of Gynecology that testing should not be done. It's not needed to be done. All you have to do is work by symptoms. That means if a woman's having hot flashes and you give her the right amount of estrogen, her hot flashes are going to disappear and she's going to feel good. That is not true. How can I make that statement? I did a test. I did, I I, I, I teach. And prior to every uh, significant annual teaching event, I'll do some kind of evaluation of what new have I learned last in the preceding year. And one year, years and years and years ago, I said, well, what, what, what have I learned about 24-hour urine hormone testing? So I examined uh, 54 tests that I had done previous to that, uh, to that teaching assignment of women who said to me, I feel good. My symptoms are gone. I've got the right dose, I think. All my symptoms are alleviated. Well, what we learned was that 50% of the women who reported they felt good and thought that they had arrived at the dose by symptom alleviation, 50% of them did not have enough estrogen to protect their bones or their vagina. That's bottom line. If you're not protecting the bones and the vagina, the likelihood that you're protecting the arteries of the brain is right. way less. 50% of the women that t- said, I feel good, did not have sufficient estrogen to protect their bones and their vagina. 25% Felt good, but they had a, amounts of estrogen that they were uh, testing out at that could cause breast glandular cell proliferation. So they were high. 25% of them. Yeah. So 75% of the women that we tested, even though they felt good, they were not in the proper optimal zone for estrogens, just for example, not to mention testosterone and DHEA. So testing to me is, an, is an imperative in the menopause method for women we test women annually. We do the same for men. We test men annually. So it's something we really want to get right. You ask yeah. the question, there's a, uh, there's a lot of different moving parts there. So you would say like once a year? Yeah, we assess every, every patient. Uh, and, and not in just with 24-hour urines. We do some blood testing. We want to test their sex hormone binding globulin in women and their um, thyroids because thyroid depletion is so common minimal above and beyond some routine testing we often want to test their ability to process glucose by testing hemoglobin a1c fasting blood glucose and insulin so there's a lot of different things we like to test in men if we're, we're treating we want to make sure they're not producing too much estradiol because testosterone can convert to estradiol, uh, absolutely. And so there is a question there. I was testosterone. <laughs> can, would you read that question, please? Yeah, it's so funny how I can read your mind. 
in a weird way. Um, this is from a gentleman, and he says, does testosterone compete with estrogen? Meaning, um, I think there's a do in there, meaning they go to the same receptors? Um, I'm going to um, explain this in a different way. Thank you. In the biochemistry, yeah. what happens is we eat food and our body takes some of that food and through a series of, of manufacturing steps, it produces, among a zillion things, hormones. So it takes the cholesterol <clears throat> that we eat and it converts that cholesterol to the active steroid hormones, those that come out of the ovary and the testicle. So male testosterone is produced from cholesterol. Very sophisticated biochemical steps. And in males and females, it's the testosterone that is converted to the estradiol. Well, all this is heavily regulated and women, um, women produce as much testosterone as they do estradiol and women need testosterone. It's not a male hormone and just the right amounts under optimal circumstances are produced. The a woman takes the cholesterol and through a series of biochemical events produces sufficient testosterone and produces sufficient estrogen. A man takes the cholesterol through a proper process, produces sufficient testosterone, and goes on to produce sufficient estrogen. Sufficient estrogen in a man? Estrogen is not a uh, exclusive female hormone. Men need sufficient amount of estrogen. In fact, men who do not have sufficient amount of estrogen do not get the protection to the arteries that estrogen oh, yeah. confers to women, for example. It even relates to male libido, but the main thing I want to point out is we need a sufficient amount of estrogen to protect our arteries. And men who are not producing sufficient amount of estrogen, well, these are the men that you hear about very rarely. And this is something you never hear about in women. That, oh my goodness, they passed out on a tennis court, had a heart attack and passed away in their 40s. He was never sick a day in his life. Had a heart attack. You never hear that about women. You do hear that about men. It's rare, but these are the men who are not getting the arterial uh, protection from sufficient conversion of their testosterone to estradiol. So they don't have the protection of the arteries that estrogen confers. Just to give you an example. So we all, we're all human and we all need the same hormones. We just have different amounts of them. So I'm going to language it that way. Does it compete with estrogen? It's related to estrogen. A man who's given too much testosterone is going to produce too much estradiol. And that's not a healthy situation. You're going to get start getting some estrogen effects that you don't want, <laughs> such as breast enlargement. Men don't like that. So you get excessive conversion of the testosterone that is that you're being treated with. So this is one of the reasons it's so important to test men to make sure you're not giving them too much testosterone. Otherwise, they're going to produce too much estradiol and they're not going to like the effects of that. So that's how they're related. Do they go to the same receptors? Where I understand this best is like, for example, and I, I don't know that this exists within males, um, but in women, there's the receptor sites. So how hormones work is you've got the hormone and it travels around to the cell nucleus and it connects up with receptor sites. So you've got estradiol, for example, or estriol connecting up with special receptor sites. And it's that interaction 
that then stimulates the effect of that hormone. You need the hormone and you need the active receptor sites and they need to link up. They need to connect. Intimacy is the healing principle. I won't go further with that one. <laughs> that, that's where I come in. <laughs> I'll explain that. <laughs> and when you have... Um, when you have these different receptor sites, you have estrogen receptor sites, you've got androgen receptor sites. The, the hormone that binds best to estrogen receptor sites are the estrogens. Mm -hmm. Duh. But they're not the only hormone that binds to estrogen receptor sites. Progesterone also binds to estrogen receptor sites but nowhere near the, the affinity and strength of binding that estrogen does. Unless you overdose with progesterone, there's a law of the chemical mass action. If you've got too much estrogen, I'm sorry, too much progesterone, it can displace estrogen from its own receptor sites just by the law of chemical mass action. I won't go further, but that's how they can interrelate. And that's how it happens in the female world. Right. That's the interrelation, which I think. Amber I have not heard of this competition within male hormone. But what is common as all get out is any man who is overtreated with testosterone is going to convert that testosterone to estradiol and is going to wind up with too much estradiol enough to cause ad adverse effects. So compete, this I don't know. But if he's overtreated, and that's how it happens. Yeah. A man has can produce too much estradiol, usually almost 100% of the time, from overtreatment with testosterone. Mm -hmm. Because it's normal for a man to convert a certain percentage of our testosterone to estradiol, and we want that. We want it for the protection of the arteries, for example. But if, you, if you're treated with too much testosterone, you're going to produce too much estradiol and you're not going to like it. Got it. And this is where I want to interject that there is a book and it's called Happy Healthy Hormones. And it was written by Dr. Rosensweet. I think it's in its seventh edition now. And um, when you come up, onto um, the ins and outs of menopause with David Rosen, Sweet MD. You can download it free and read it. And rarely do I say should, but I'm going to say you should read it because <laughs> it's really good. And it explains so much of this. And if you don't read it once, read it three times <laughs> and you'll understand this really well because it can seem complex, but you'll get there. So Oh, and thank you for that compliment. <laughs> it's because of this man right here. Thank you. He says, it says, this is a master class. It's a nice, nice um, I'm for uh, Scott. There's an excellent book. I'm assuming Scott's a male. Uh, there's an excellent book written by uh, Eugene Shippen, S-H-I-P-P-E-N. He's a medical doctor. He um, he wrote a book called Testosterone, and you're going to get the same details that I'm describing as it relates to women in Happy Healthy Hormones, the relationship of all these hormones for men and the relationship of testosterone to estradiol. And is the relationship the same with women? Well, here's the deal. You don't want to give women too much testosterone. We want to give women the right amount of testosterone. Every single woman that I've ever tested, we're talking a thousand approximately, 90% of them are going to be low in testosterone by the time their period ceased. And 100% of them are going to be low in testosterone three years after their, their last period. 90% of them are going to be, as their periods are getting irregular in their 40s and 50s, maybe even in their 30s, they're going to be low in testosterone. I assert that it's imperative to replenish testosterone in all women. And we want to get it right, I'll tell you. Ooh. 
you give a woman too little testosterone, she's going to get sarcopenia. Many women will lose their libido from the loss of testosterone. And testosterone, like all these hormones, they're so powerful and they're so, they go to every single cell. We want to get this right. But if you give a woman too much testosterone, mm -mm. she's going to get oily skin. Oh, let's not do bad. She's going to get hair growth in her mustache area and chin. Uh-oh. She's going to get hair growth in other areas as well. She's going to get too testosterone-ish, too irritable. So she's going to get mood issues as well. So the idea is pretty simple. It's replenish the right amount and don't give too much. These hormones are so strong, you give too much, you're going to have effects that you don't want. Now, is some of the testosterone in women going to convert to estradiol? Hard to know. This isn't written about very commonly because it's not common to overdose a woman with testosterone because we don't want to do that. Now, her ovaries are producing testosterone and some of that, uh, when, when her ovaries are active, and some of that testosterone is getting converted to estradiol, but under optimal circumstances, under healthy circumstances, the body is producing just the right amount, just the right amount of estrogen to do all the extraordinary beneficial effects of estrogen, just the right amount of testosterone to do the imperative and wonderful effects of testosterone, same with progesterone and same with DHEA. So the yes, uh, some testosterone does convert to estradiol in women, there's also another pathway to produce estrogens in women. Bottom line, our bodies know how to do this. And uh, we do, I think, really excellent work when the ovaries are no longer doing that to replenish them at levels that are just the optimal amount to do all the great stuff that uh, these hormones do. It's pretty amazing. And we've discussed that so many times. Um yeah so now i have ideas of doing a whole facebook live on testosterone <laughs> for men and for women yeah. um because many women are straight up told no 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 yeah you know? let's do it i mean if there's enough men attending this ins and outs of men oh pause it's not men yeah. oh pause <laughs> <laughs> That's that's given the name Andro Buzz. <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I don't understand all that. I never understood that. Men o pause. Anyway, semantics. So, my next question, and thank you, Scott. Thank you, everybody, and thank you, Dr. Rosensweet, certainly for the really great answers, because um, they are great. Um, we had visited part of this question last time um, in our last um, Facebook Live. It's a woman and she was using a particular way of uh, taking her hormones um, and everything was fine until it absolutely went south and she crashed, just crashed and burned and nothing was working well for her at all. She felt awful. So fast forward about a month, um, she didn't take anything she had a horrible withdrawal which is odd um it, to me anyway uh but she did and um she thought she would try a really minuscule amount like toothpick size amount of um estrogen this made her extremely irritable anxious i mean just horrible feelings of um cortisol surges and she says it was it was just really really horrible and what happened is she went 36 days without a period and then she got a period and it lasted for three it's in fact she still has it it's been lasting three weeks um she tested she has a, a benign fibroid and cyst um but stopping the hormones for her cold turkey was really really brutal and now she can't seem to be able to tolerate any estrogen or progesterone either and she doesn't know what to do. She doesn't understand this. She wants to know if you've ever seen this. Is she going to be like a woman who will never be able to take hormones again? I mean, she's really terrified. So we thought we might ask you about that. Hmm. I'd like to uh, preface this by saying 
This is not a common story. No. And yet, it's common enough. And there's two elements of this story. One is that a woman is, sounds like in the perimenopause because she still had a, a, a menstruated here that a woman reached out to try and address symptoms and had a rough time. Now, this is a fairly common story. And what, just to cut to the chase, the job of this particular questionnaire, qu questioner is she's got to do some hefty research. And the research that she must do is to seek out and find a healthcare professional, a physician or nurse practitioner who's specializing in treating women and hormones mm -hmm. with compounded bioidentical hormones. And she's got to find someone who's got some major training and experience. Because I assert that there isn't an individual woman's issue that can't be figured out. But sometimes it takes an expert to do it. The, the, the belief out there is, well, I go into menopause, I'll just take some Premer and Prempro or whatever, and I'll be fine. Or I'll even do compounded bioidentical hormones. And I'll be fine. Boom, no, that it's these hormones are the most powerful biochemicals in our body. They're the amount that each individual woman needs varies enormously. Just in estrogen, for example, one woman may need this much, where another woman needs three times this much, or anything in between. And we're talking for hormones here Estro the estrogen family, progesterone, testosterone and DHA and women's balance differ woman to woman. There's some women who have been relatively rich in estrogen and relatively leaner in testosterone and leaner in progesterone, whereas other women have been more robust in progesterone, leaner in estrogen and middle in testosterone. The balance of these four hormones, this isn't a problem for someone who's gotten very significant training and has quite a bit of experience and knows how to test properly. It's not a problem for some, for someone who's really taken on specializing in this. And these specialists are rare. Unlike any other branch of medicine, where there's residency programs for urology or neurology or internal medicine or orthopedic surgery or obstetrics and gynecology, these are three to five year programs or longer where the physicians are trained and mentored by a staff physicians who've got the tremendous amount of experience and age in there to really help them with individual cases. This never occurred in hormonal medicine. Just as the other specialties were developing in medicine, out comes this medical study that sabotages the treatment of women with hormones and physicians were afraid that they, if they gave women hormones, they were gonna increase their risk for breast cancer and women were terrified to take it. Men had a similar fear that if they took testosterone, they were gonna promote prostate cancer. Both of those assertions were the exact opposite of what actually science shows. Men who are given testosterone are at less risk for prostate cancer than men who are not treated. Women who are treated with hormones are at less risk for breast cancer, heart attack, and stroke than women who go untreated. We're all at risk for stuff. As a male, I'm at risk for all kinds of cancers, in, including uh, I have a special increased relative risk for prostate cancer. But it ain't the hormones that's causing it. The hormones are protective in that regard. Women are at special increased relative risk for breast cancer. There's reasons for that. However, if women are treated with hormones, they're at less risk for breast cancer, heart attack, and stroke than women who do not receive hormonal treatment. Well, the false reporting in the early 2000s scared people away from the field of treating women and the whole field did not acquire this board certification, the standards of care did not acquire it. 
well, I've been treating women in menopause for 28 years and specializing in it. And so one of the thing, projects that we're doing is developing standards of care. We feel like we've actually accomplished that and trying to um, get board certification for this. Why? Because it seems like you should be able to take two aspirin and see me in the morning. You'll be fine with menopause or let's just take two hormones and you'll be fine. And we'll, we'll see you next year. It ain't that way. I found that out the hard way. <laughs> I remember that. There's a lot of moving parts and to replenish these hormones properly requires in many, many instances, someone who really knows what they're doing. And that's why, and this is what I learned from working with you, Carolyn, and as well as being interviewed by many others, is there's a lot of disgruntled and discouraged women out there. Oh, oh yeah. Because they reached out to get treatment in menopause and it wasn't so easy. So I've said a lot of words to say to this woman, I'm sorry to hear that you've had such a rough time. This having a rough time is a really common story. This translates into one job for you. You got to do some research and you've got to interview. First, first of all, you interview your local compounding pharmacists. You call them up and say, who in my community is prescribing compounded bioidentical hormones? And more than that, would you be willing to recommend your very best? Because I do not have a simple case. So I don't know where this woman lives, but geez, there's 8,000 compounding pharmacists in the United States. Yeah. Most moderate sized cities have three of them. Some of them have 10 of them. So there are, so you look up compounding pharmacists and interview, go in and interview your compounding pharmacists and ask them to please tell me who your very best is because I do not have a simple situation here. That's my first recommendation. Go to menopausemethod.com. Go to bright.live. Oh, well, that's a we new one for me. We've been, training, we've been training physicians and nurse practitioners for years, and we might have a physician and nurse practitioner in your state. And that's the main thing I do is I train and mentor physicians and nurse practitioners in advising compounding pharmacists and so also PAs. Bright.live bright or go to menopause method if you're a woman menopausemethod.com and there's a way to reach in and uh, if we have a provider that we've trained in your state to get that recommendation to you. And um, because you need to find an expert and you need to interview them. Now you're not going to make it past the office manager, but the office manager is going to know the degree to which um, that office treats uh women with compounded bioidentical hormones and good docs and good nurse practitioners have good office managers. <laughs> That's for sure. They need them. <laughs> Their staff is going to be some of the best. If they're good, they're going to, they're going to want to create and they will create successfully. Their, uh, an excellent staff. So, they're going to have a person in that office who's going to know how to talk to a woman and answer her questions. And you got to get a feel for it because sometimes you got to go shopping. <clears throat> sometimes you got to interview, you got to actually make appointments and show up in the office with or show up by telemedicine because telemedicine works great for women in menopause and men in andropause. It's terrific. That means you have access to doctors and nurse practitioners all over the state in which you reside if they're doing telemedicine. And the most uh, savvy of the uh, physicians and nurse practitioners are doing telemedicine these days. So you do some interviewing. Many physicians and nurse practitioners will offer a no charge initial consult. So using search engines, using your friends, interview your friends. Women, it's highly likely that one of your friends or your community is going to be on compounded bioidentical hormones and see who they're using. See, get the reputation of those that they're using. See how much they love them. Because bottom line, 
this woman is presenting a very challenging case. And we don't know which elements of the many, many moving parts are giving her trouble. I don't have enough information. I mean, our first visit is extensive. We have women fill out a questionnaire that takes them between a half hour and an hour to fill out. We learn a tremendous amount and we do testing to see what's given her trouble. Some Here's the thing. If she's having a tough time, there's trouble in River City. You know, there's stuff that needs attention. Yes. And yes. I personally have, for any patient that I've stuck, that's stuck with me, I, there hasn't been a case that I haven't been able to solve. Now, there have yeah. been maybe two or three over 28 years who have dropped out along the way. They weren't enjoying the process with me. And for, for someone who's really trained in treating women, bring on the hard cases. They're, they're, they're entertaining. They're fun. I'm flying in tonight. <laughs> and some um, flown I'm in. Huh? And we, we, some women have flown in. Um, oh, yes. I like, bet for example, have. we have a, 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 a woman on our staff that is critical to our whole, the functioning of our team. Bless her heart. Oh, I yes. Names right now. How did, how did she get involved with us? She flew in from out of state because she had a challenging menopausal situation that nobody could solve. So I had an office in Florida and she, my, my goodness, she flew a long ways to do an initial consult with me. We could handle the rest by phone in those days. That was a long time ago. So sometimes yeah. you gotta do what you need to do. Sometimes you need to fly in to another state to find the, the proper provider. Correct. But and you one can thing, do it. One thing you say all the time that I just hang on to, and that is healing is possible. Healing is possible. And for many of us, when we're in it and it's a nightmare, we don't feel that way. But healing is, I'm living proof of it. I know she is. And, you know, healing is possible and that's positive and thank you carolyn gotta love it i know that 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 minute just struck three. <laughs> oh, we my went, uh oh we went over but well i know. would like to emphasize that and thank you for bringing that up yeah um we get unwell and we have uh biological and health challenges there's always reasons they always boil down to issues of nutrition, toxicity and detoxification, exercise too much or too little, and the elephant in most people's room is stress. And when, when a woman or a man is getting symptoms, there's a purpose behind this. This is nature in action. These symptoms get loud enough, strong enough for a purpose. And the purpose is to stop someone in their tracks and get us to ask the question, what's going on here? Yeah. And to come up with the right answer or answers. And those answers are going to found, be found and in repairing things that matter to people. What you eat, what you breathe. Very often, often enough, in women who are having hormonal balance troubles, there's a detoxification issue. Or there's a life issue. Where their body is signaling with extremely strong symptoms because they've got to pay attention to something that's really hard to pay attention to. Wow, wow, wow. There's a stress yeah. in their life that is so severe that they can't avoid it anymore. Mm-hmm. Often that's marital issues. Often there's addictions involved. So I'm not going to go deeper than that right now, but there's a biology to it and there's an emotionality and life to it. And the answers are there. And it takes good detective work and teamwork and part of patient and provider to sort out, well, what's the most important things here? What's the next steps? What do we need to test? 
and uh, it gets very rewarding. Extremely Absolutely. rewarding. For both. So, for both. The, I, I would start with, even though you're having a tough time, questioner, respect it. It's driving you to find the proper solutions of what matters. And you can be sure things that matter to you, your life, your heart, your soul, your body, there's things that are, need to be uncovered and dealt with. Biologically, sometimes it can be as obscure as there's an abnormal situation in your intestinal tract that's messing with how you process hormones. Or there's some toxicity that you've been creeping in for decades and decades that's messing up the receptor sites. Or the right hormones are not being given in the right balance, too much or too little. So there wasn't enough information that the woman provided who asked that question. I mean, when we spend, uh, when we review a 12-page questionnaire, <laughs> Those questions are there for reasons, not just for our entertainment, because we want to learn a lot about you. And then we also do some very sophisticated testing when needed to sort out challenging problems. And bottom line, as you said, Carolyn, you reminded me of something that I've said over and over again. Healing is possible. And it's a thrill. And if you take the do, if you, t and sometimes the projects are bigger than we ever thought. Oh, my God. What did they lead us into? <laughs> our life and the stresses of our lives that we had to address. Oh, my God. Or we had to clean up our diet or we had to clean up exposures to toxic toxins or we had to clean up our intestinal tract. So big project, but the, with the end, the result is due to due diligence, you can figure it out. Healing is possible. And with that, I, don't, I could go on and on and on, but I, I'm being very protective because I see we went over by eight minutes. And uh, thank you for that, for sure. Um, I think that- And uh, indeed, I need to sign off. I know. So I am going to wish you and everybody a really, really happy Thanksgiving. Really happy Thanksgiving. We have a lot to be thankful for. We do. I know I do. Um, and as always, Dr. Rosensweet, dear, dear Dr. Rosensweet, thank you for the wonderful answers. Thank you for your kind time. Geez, I'm almost three years in now. <laughs> it's like amazing. And I'm very thankful for you, Carolyn. Aw. All the support that you give to women and the fun we get to have almost every week. Uh, and uh, I'm very, we're, we're thankful for you, Carolyn, for, for the benefit that you have to so many human beings. Thank you. I appreciate that. It is really my pleasure. It's what I love. So I'm very grateful to be able to do what I love. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. It's a quality problem. <laughs> <laughs> enjoy. Everybody enjoy. We will see you next Tuesday. And um, yeah. I, there's this conference that I'm teaching at, so I think next Tuesday works. I think so, because I but may be going now, to that concert. We'll, we'll be missing a week here very soon. Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, so I'm going to sign off right now. Bye-bye, okay. everybody. See you later.